record. Oh, we're recording. Excellent. Right. So tonight we're going to be talking about keeping the boat flat. Okay. And then Carl is going to talk to us after I've gone through this. Uh, the weather. And uh, that's very interesting too. He's got some really good expert techniques he's been working on. So, <clears throat> unlike yachts, dinghies are designed to be sailed flat. There's no arguing about it. They're drawn on a design board where everything's square, flat, and they don't like to heal. So tonight we're going to talk about why you keep it flat, how you keep it flat, and try and see if we can pick some good points. So here's a little video just on the basics of boat balance that we, uh, we found earlier, which just talks about the very basics of everything we're going to have a look at tonight. I'm just going to play this for you. And there needs to be some sound. Can we hear sound on you guys? No. No. Do you want to do no. the share sound thing again? Uh, sorry, one second. Share sound. When the boat is flat, the waterline shape is symmetrical. When the boat leans over, this shape becomes distorted. The result is that the boat will want to turn towards the wind. To keep sailing straight, you'll need to use the rudder, which creates drag and will slow you down. To help balance the boat, you can lean out using the toe straps to take your weight. If you're sailing a two-handed boat, try to work as a team, but be sure to use the toe straps. You should also be ready to release the main sheet slightly when you become overpowered by a gust of wind. By releasing the sail slightly, the front edge of the sail will flap, which reduces the power in the sail and helps you to balance the boat. The wind has a habit of wavering in direction and altering in strength as gusts of wind come and go. You must constantly move your weight in and out to balance the boat, which is great exercise. Search the channel for the next. Yeah, excellent. So one of the things they mentioned when they were showing the drawings was that word drag. We mentioned drag last week when we were talking about telltales and sail trim. And drag and flow are two things we have to think about in sailing all the time. So here's a question. I think we've got a few few people that are on here tonight over there. I think that's, uh, that's Malcolm Buchanan there, I think. Uh, so yeah, Malcolm, Robin, Sean, and I think that's Mark from our solo training day with Pete Mitchell a few years ago. Um, so open question to everyone. What causes drag under the water when we're sailing? The foils. Yeah, the foils. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, yeah. the water. Uh, the, just the hull. Yeah. Anything yeah. that's in the water. Mm. Yeah. The, the rudder. Foil. Foils, especially the rudder. The the centerboard is is quite rigid, so you know it doesn't move around too much. But the rudder, and when the boat isn't flat, is massive break. I think I've got a really nice little video here. Check this out from a Saturday afternoon at the club a few years ago. I think that's the right Honourable Nick Ingram there. Yeah. But this is the boat we want to keep an eye on. Yeah, so, definitely. <laughs> but both boats here have just taken a gust. Uh, Nick and his Aero 7, I think, there. And I, I can't see what this is. I think it's an RS Vario. Okay, so let's just watch. Both boats just taken a gust. They're healing. And let's see what happens. Now, let's just look at this frozen there. Okay, boat healed. You can see the rudder, is, is, the tiller's being pulled towards him. He's trying to bear off, but the boat is leaning over. And because the boat's leaning over, the boat wants to round up into the wind, not bear off. And that results in drag. So 
when you're trying to move the boat when you're sailing upwind every time you pull the rudder and the boat's leaning over you are going to be causing this drag this break here now i know that this is overemphasizing the point but as we roll the video on you'll see this guy can't turn uh, at all because of the heel on the boat And eventually, I think Nick takes his wind a bit there, the boat comes flat and he can get it under control. <laughs> this is quite amazing, isn't it? How much effect that heel has versus the rudder. You think he's pulling the, the tiller towards him probably 25, 30 degrees and all the boat wants to do is stop. It doesn't want to go where the rudder is telling it to. So what tells us the boat is heeled over? Because when we're sailing upwind and we think we're flat, how, how do we know we're flat? You know, even just a small amount of heel will have that effect because you will counteract that heel with the rudder. So how would we know? Anyone got any uh, ideas about that? If you've got a bit of water in the boat, you'll see that it's on the far side away from you if you're healed at all. That's that's a good one. I hadn't actually thought of that one at all, Malcolm. That's very good, yeah. The other one I thought hadn't thought to add, which Carl pointed out earlier, was uh, using a clinometer, which, you know, <laughs> like a spirit level. Uh, yeah. Any other yeah. ideas? What about, yeah. what about the wake? The wake, yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, the wake, yeah. Anyone else got anything else? The pull on the rudder. Pressure the on the rudder, yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. OK, so let's have a look and see what we've got here. OK, so what can tell us that the boat's healed? Um, even just a small amount. So, yeah, one, one thing a lot of people use is the horizon. I've drawn a little yellow line there. I know it's not the horizon, but it's, it's the water's edge. So if you're sailing towards a beach, you can still kind of reference the flat point. But this boat is being sailed pretty well, isn't it? I mean, that mast is almost 90 degrees. But our friend Graham here, he could just stick his shoulders out a little bit more, or his lovely wife, Mrs. Camford Smith, could maybe just move a little bit more to windward, keep it a little bit more upright. The load in the sheets. Everything's strapped in there. And so he could be using more, more body movement to keep the boat flat because there's obviously not much wind. They're not overpowered, but also control of the sheets trying to stop that resistance from the rudder. As Malcolm said, the feel on the rudder, you see good helms hold the, hold the tiller you know, between two fingers as light as they can. So, so whenever they're getting a, a, an effect on the rudder because of the boat's heel, they can, they can feel that there's drag happening on their rudder and therefore they stick their shoulders out and pull the boat a bit more flat. Because of all this, the boat's wanting to turn, as it said in our video, because it's it's asymmetric, not symmetric in the waterline. And then also, as was mentioned earlier, sorry, I can't remember who said it, um, the sound of the boat, the wake. You know, for me, I sail a Merlin rocket like one of these, and that wake coming off the back there, that little triangular thing, you know, if I hear that, I can hear the, the transom in the water and bubbling as you get behind the back. That's like nails down a chalkboard to me. I really can't stand that. So I'm always trying to move forward, boat flatter, get the boat so it feels right, release that tiller so that you know I'm just holding it with, with two fingers and it's and it's working efficiently with no drag on it. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Joe just read. Joe Barable, are you all right? Did you miss something there? Carol, can I just add this point about the water in the boat? Of course you can, um, yeah. Yeah, you're going along and you think you're flat. So you yeah. look at the horizon and so on and so forth. You think you're doing a great job. Then you look down at the water in the boat and you realise, oh, actually, I'm nowhere near flat. Because <laughs> yes. the water would be in the middle. So it gives you that last little bit. Yeah. Although the, the only thing to capture out that, Marco, that it's been very harsh is that, you know, you don't want to have any water in your boat. 
Well done, Gareth. I was just thinking it, but didn't say it out loud. <laughs> just the spray coming over the front because you're going so fast, you see. <laughs> exactly. But, well, exactly. In your well, opinion. you say that. <laughs> um, but no, the thing is, Malcolm's got a really good point because, you know, I've listed a few things here. And for me, it's the feel and it's the noise of the wake and the, the noise of whether the transom's reacting badly, you know, if the, the flow of the water doesn't feel right, if I can feel the drag. But that's not the only reference guide. Sometimes you're not going to be able to get those senses for whatever reason. It might be a bit choppy. And if it is a bit choppy, you're going to get water in the boat. And in that case, you know, observing things like Malcolm pointed out are fantastic for uh, making sure you're flat. And it really is critical. Okay, so what's next? Let's just click on it. So what causes a boat to heal? I'll open this to everyone. Anyone got any good ideas? What makes your the wind. boat heal? Yeah. Yeah. Did he oh, say the wind? Wind, yeah. yeah. We got wind. What else we got? Oh, Waves. Yeah, waves, yeah. Um, body, body weight. Body yeah. weight, yeah, yeah, definitely. Centiboards up. Centiboard being up, yeah, that can be a big one. Sometimes that can be helpful for you keeping the boat flat, but we'll come to that another day, I think. Too, too much water in the boat. Too much water <laughs> in the boat and not, not flat with the horizon, yeah. Sail not trimmed. Sail not trimmed, yeah. No, they're all good, very good answers. So what we look at here is just four key little ones. So gust, wind, body weight, rudder movement. I don't know if you ever noticed, but if you go out in light wind, if you actually give some, a boat a lot of rudder in the same way that if you heal the boat because of the wind or with your body weight to try and initiate turn, you'll also find that if you just keep the boat flat, maybe standing in the boat with, the set, with no wind, if you turn the rudder away from you, the boat will lean away from you if you pull the rudder towards you and that's something to keep in mind when you're when you're trying to steer through breeze sail control as kate said there at the end exactly here's a really nice little video uh, video of our mate robin millage sailing his solo very well uh, sorry very well uh, again at this uh, solo training day we did with pete mitchell a couple of years ago and i'll just click this on so, yeah. so we're just looking at a few of the things Rob's having a good look around he's actually thinking about tacking at this point I think and as he did that the boat healed a little bit more you can see there's a little little gust on the water just ahead of him a little bit of a dark patch you see how Rob sort of reacts to that he's lent out a little bit more he's pulled the boat on top of him you see the booms moving so there's a bit of bit of sail control there to keep it the rudder movement very nice, very stationary, not much wake. As the boat heals, you can see that wake coming off there to leeward. He's having a good look. And now he's noticed we're watching him. <laughs> and he starts to heal. And this is what happens when you're in a coach boat. As soon as they see you there, it all goes wrong. He needs to stick his shoulders out a bit more there because you can see the heel on the boat. And as you can see that heel on the boat, you can see he's using more rudder, and there's more wake. You can see that white water there, that turbulence coming off the back of the rudder. And uh, uh, yeah, he lost concentration. It's my fault because I was following him. Poor old Rob. Right, so let's have a look at these. So gusts. We've talked quite a bit over the last couple of weeks about gusts. You can see in this picture some really nice dark patches there. And they're, they're coming down the water at you. One of the other things that's really important is the anticipation. How long is it going to take for that gust to hit? One of the things you can do when you're doing pre-start work, you know, you get out your 20 minutes, half an hour before the start of a race, or even when you're sailing out to uh, Bavistock at Lymington, you just have a look at the gusts as they approach you. And just maybe count them in. So, all right, that gust looks like it's about 10 seconds away. And count down 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Oh. That's it, I've got the gust. Okay, so I'm wrong. that is actually six seconds away. The next time you see a gust, you're like, that distance is six seconds and you can count that gust in. And if you're sailing two up, like Catherine and the Scorpion and so on, yeah, either the crew or the helm can be wind spotting. And they say, right, 
<clears throat> big gusts come in, five seconds. Five, four, three, ease the sheet, lean out a bit more, get ready, sail through the gut, take the speed, bank it. What do we do to keep the boat flat in the, in the gusts? Let's throw that out there. I mean, I gave you a few pointers then. What sort of things do you think about as, as gusts are approaching you? Change of direction. Change of direction. Body yep. weight. Body weight. Yep. On your boat, Kate, you just get the crew to hike out a lot harder than you because you, you've got a keel boat. Hmm? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Flat backs upwind. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Let's have a look at body weight. Okay. Here's the lovely Hannah Snellgrave, probably one of the best hikers in the business and a laser radial. Uh, bad bad angle here and she's she's sailing in in Aarhus I think by the looks of that oil rig over there um this is one of the gustiest shiftiest venues on the sort of Olympic circuit over the last few years so body weight put your weight in the right place to balance the boat so in that respect why would your weight not be like Hannah all the time Because she's what? very fit. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is that as well. But there's also think about you know different wind conditions. You know, some days we're yep. we actually we really don't want to be hiking flat out the whole time, do we? Um, you know, the, too much wind, you'd actually heal the boat to windward. That's just as bad as leeward heel. It can often neutralize your helm, make the rudder nice and easy. But it's only a couple of degrees. We really don't want to get the boat too much on top of us. Use your weight to drive the boat. So what would happen if you hike really hard and the wind doesn't change? The boat will bear away. The boat will bear away, exactly. So you, you can steer your, your boat with your body. And it's a really good experiment in the same way as that video I showed of the rudder being pulled really hard while the boat was healing. It's a really good experiment to try and steer your boat when you're sailing upwind in a reasonably consistent breeze, something you're quite comfortable with. When you do that, you see how much effort you need to do to make that boat bear away. You know, for me and my boat, if, if, if my crew's sitting inboard because it's light and I'm just sitting on the edge, maybe just about hiking, both of us have to hike to make the boat bear away. So if we wanted to steer to our telltales without actually using the rudder any more than holding it in two fingers, He's got to really move around as a crew. And if you're in a single hand, like Hannah here or, uh, you know, or the Aero Gang, you know, the amount of kinetic movement, the amount of effort you have to put in to get the boat to do what you want it to do when you're trying to steer it with your weight, it's quite impressive. It's well worth us all having a good practice at that. Rudder movement, here it is. The video we were talking about earlier on, I think, this was just sailing back to the club on a lovely afternoon, Saturday afternoon training. Uh, Dan Bird, Air A7, and I think he's just sailing superbly in this. Um, we're looking at the way that he minimises his rudder movement. He use, he's, I, I'm presuming he's using the rudder to feel whether there's drag because he's holding the rudder very lightly, so he should be able to feel what's going on. And seeing he's on here, maybe he can talk us through if, if he can remember what he was thinking. Um, and you can see him move his shoulders a little bit and kinetically balance and pull the boat and just kind of steer the boat as he's going upwind. Let me just play this video for you. Okay, so we're looking at that. Nicely balanced. Look at that, little, little head movements, little dips, getting the boat under control, minimal rudder. It's obviously very shifty here because he's coming out the river, but he's not using the rudder too much and he's taking those lifts and you can see the sail moving at the same time as the rudder, which is very good. Helps, you know, if, if, you, if you pull the tiller towards you and you pull the sail in at the same time, you're counteracting each other. If you want to bear off a bit, ease the sail a bit. It's just a little trick, change in settings. I think you probably went for a little bit more cunning in there, by the looks of it. Is that right? Or maybe a kicker. A little bit more rudder movement there. You can see the white weight coming off the back. And then I've told him to tack. There we go, so his tack. There we go. 
not too much turbulence coming off the back of the boat. A good pump to get the boat moving again. And again, rudder stationary. And it looks like a, a bit of a one of those, isn't it, Dan? Nice work. Really good. Yeah. Excellent. Good work. All right. So here's another one. Sail control. So easing before the gust hits. Steering with the sail. I just talked a little bit about it with Dan. You can see it really nicely here with uh, Simon and his RS100 when I play this. Um, you can, making sure that you can you steer and trim at the same time. Making sure that you can do it. One of the best things for uh, keeping an eye on, 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 sorry, keeping a handle on your ability to be able to steer and trim at the same time is very much about the um, ergonomics of your sailing. Your tiller in one hand, your main sheet in the other, and you need the two of these things near to each other so that if you have to pull on more main sheet, you've got your, uh, your tiller hand, your thumb as a cleat so you can work together. People sailing with the, uh, the tiller behind them, they're operating with one hand and they really struggle to actually play sheet. Okay, let's have a look at this video here. Okay. Sailing along. Turn the sound off there. It's just me shouting notes at myself while I'm watching. Okay, so there's a bit of chop here. He's bored off, born off a little bit. He eased the sheet as he bore off. Now he does this swinging arm thing. It's a habit Simon has of trying to get the boat flat again. That's him using his kinetics to do it. That's it. A little bit of chop again. He's just born off a bit. He's eased the main as he's done it. Minimal rudder movement. And he's doing the swinging arm thing again to get the boat flat. More chop. There we go. Just picking up on that swinging arm thing. Um, yeah. Our friend Mark Jacoby, who's the American Aero 9 yeah. double world champion, he's got a real thing. He really sticks his arm out high. I've seen him coming off the start line. He really gives it that. That's yeah. quite effective, especially if you're a bit light on air. Simon's swinging arm thing was a bit, a bit weedy. Yeah. That. You want to get right out if you're going to do that. Yeah, yeah. Just you know, know. As Saying earlier, it, it takes a lot of effort to, to pull your boat so enough so that it will bear off no matter what type of boat you're sailing. Okay, so any questions on where we've got to so far? Just uh, one comment if I could, sure. Gareth. So if yeah. I um, think back to when you were following Rob, Robin Millage. Yeah. In the solo. So he at various times was not quite flat. Yes. So are you saying that um, in terms of calibrating what flat means, uh, Robin was doing an okay job, but it was still not as flat as you would like it to be? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah there were two bits. And I, pretty flat. <laughs> as I admitted, um, some of that's my fault because I was, me and Pete were probably talking to Rob uh, while we were filming him. He was becoming more aware of us, which is uh, the coach's curse, really, for him. But, uh, yeah, but for us trying to emulate what flat means, if you like, it's even flatter than what we saw Robin doing. Yeah, even flatter. The flatter, the better. It's um, yeah. I think on, on the, from the solo point of view, Malcolm. There's some great video footage of uh, yeah. Charlie from North Sales, Charlie Cumley sailing upwind on the solo YouTube. I think anyone sailing any single handers should check out because he's got fantastic technique and he makes it look effortless but he sells that boat absolutely bolt upright um, well, one of the things we do on the scorpion to know we're upright is um not only we've got an inclinometer in the stern for dave to check but the foredeck's got quite a crown to it and so when i'm hiking if my head eye line is level with the crown i know that we're flat Right. But if so, you, if you can find something on your boat to sight when you know you're flat as well, to help me when you're flat as well, the arrow is quite good because you can see under the boom if you're doing it properly. Very good. Okay, so the flat really does mean flat. Properly flat, yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously, in the very light, you might ease up a little bit, but certainly, yeah, in, in, in any sort okay. of power conditions like these. Yeah. Yes, you. please. And here we go. So, good sailing technique 10 tips to good sailing technique upwind. One, flat boat. Two, eyes on the gusts. Three, reacting in advance. Four, taking the speed when you can get it. So as you see a gust approach, 
if you ease the sail and you keep the boat flat, the boat will accelerate as you get that gust. You won't heel over. You won't use the rudder as a brake. Minimal rudder movement. Steer with body weight and sail control. Ease and lean out to bear away. Come in and sheet on a little bit when you want to come back up. The ability to trim and steer at the same time. Tiller should be in front of you so you can use it to work with your main sheet. No panhandle steering. There is a good reason to do panhandle steering in light stuff. And, you know, we can talk about that another day. But in general, I'd like to see everyone using their dagger grip on their tiller and working with two hands. Rule eight, keep the boat flat. Rule nine, keep the boat flat. Rule 10, keep the boat flat. Here's another little video for you. Mark, sailing upwind. Uh, no kicker. Sure, yeah. The boat flat at the top. Yeah. Oh, the drum's just come up. Okay, here we there go. You know. See how much we can just put that drum up there, just at the top. Yes. Just a bit of camber there. Got a little bit of camber. Just going to turn that sound off there. So Mark's one of the one of the, the top uh, solo guys at our club. He does pretty well. And Malcolm, he's got a few top tens of the nationals, hasn't he, over the years? Yes, he has, yeah. He's very yeah. good. Very good sailor. But all the other Limpton boys are hot on his heels when he's racing here. So, you know, he never gets to escape. But great example. So just frozen right at the beginning there. Who thinks that boat's flat? Anyone? No, it's not. No, not, not quite. It's close, isn't it? Um, it's a bit unfair to say there's wake off the rudder because we're not really looking down on the rudder here. But, uh, you know, that could just be the stern wave uh, and or, or, or the wave that just passed him. But as we play on... Oh, wait a minute. Sorry. Go back. There we go. We just have a look. Minimal rudder. Now... I, I'm at a little bit of an angle to him as well, which is a bit unfair. He is almost flat, but he's also looking to make adjustments. You might have heard on Pete's commentary when I had the sound on there. Mark's adjusting the traveller because he consider, we considered that the top of the sail was a little bit flat. He's made... squeeze it when he does come flat, Gareth. Yeah, sure. Just trying to find it. He's got a little bit of a gust there. You can see him getting out a little bit more. He's hiking it hard to get it out. Right. Whoa! Oh, why does it do that? Quite early on, there's one where he's absolutely snap, snap second. He's doing pretty well holding that there, no kicker. Yeah, now, he can't see it. Well, maybe, maybe someone else should call it in when they think he's flat. Yeah. Let's go. Let me go back to full screen. There we go. That's flat. Yeah, cool. I was a second too late then. Well, what I'm looking at is the mass perpendicular to the horizon. So quite often when you're filming yourself or being filmed there, that's yeah. quite a good judge. How, how, what percentage of time. And if you can't be absolutely flat, the key is not to be moving around too much. As long as you're steady, it's okay. Yeah. You know, even with like a degree or two, you might never, you know, if you're light like us in a bit of breeze, you might ne never get it totally flat, but you, you one or two degrees of heel. And just as long as you're stable in that heel, it's acceptable. And you can feel that heel on your rudder, you know, if, mm, if you get much. used it's, to it. It's doing this all the time, it's the issue. Yeah. And it's the, the dodgy cam work's not helping a little bit there, I must admit. Yeah. That was Pete filming, not me. Anyhow, yeah, there we go. So, oh, Nigel Brookin joining in. That's nice. Um, any questions there on keeping the boat flat? Silence. Okay, Who's passionate about keeping the boat flat? <laughs> That's what Paul Brothers. What, what do you mean by taking the speed when you can get it, Gareth? Taking the speed when you can get it. So, as you you're looking for gusts ahead of you, yes. you're counting that gust in. You know that it's going to be five, four, three. When it gets to three, ease that sheet a little bit, hike that a little bit harder, get ready so that when that gust hits, the boat doesn't lean, the boat stays flat all the way through. And as the boat stays flat all the way through, 
we can then cheat on and the boat will accelerate. If the boat heals, it won't accelerate. Okay, so you're going to shoot back in on the, what I call on the back of the gust. Yeah, yeah, on the back of the so gust. As the gust has gone through, so you've eased the sheet, gust goes through, and then as the gust starts dying away, you start shooting back in again. Yes, exactly. And I would, I'd, be, I'd be making that judgment call on how I feel the helm as I'm going through the gust. I don't want to feel the pull on the helm. I don't want to have to hold the tiller. I want to be able to steer like that as this gust approaches. I'm watching, I'm watching. I ease a little bit of my main sheet. The shoulders go out. I drop a bit further. I'm hiking harder. And then as that gust goes through, I'm then back sheeting on and maintaining that speed, keeping that boat flat. And I don't want to feel that rudder pull at any point as I go into a gust. And then I know by listening to my boat that I can feel that, you know, that I've increased the speed. Mm. Very good. Excellent. All right. Shall we move on to weather, Carl? Why not? Why not? Why okay. Not? Why so not? if I stop there, um, have I got to just move the... You're going to make me the host. Make him the host. There we go. Change it to Carl. There we go, Carl. All right. You're hosting. Cheers, Carl. That's really good. Cheers. you'll see the screen okay there yeah yep. does it say weather forecasting it does bloody hell <laughs> right this is very interactive so please pitch in it's uh open to questions because I, I when i practiced this with gareth earlier i had the tendency to drone on a bit and not leave any room for interaction so i'm quite conscious of that try and pep it up a bit from earlier because it was pretty dry last time I ran this so <laughs> see if we can make it a bit better <laughs> right first thing to qualify is I am by no means a weather guru um, it's something I've always paid attention to as a sailor like a lot of us do and it's something we spent a lot of time during the last lockdown working on because um, we had time on our hands and I've been desperate to share this with someone um, since the stuff we learned. And so what I've got is um, a kind of framework or a recipe that you can use every day that you go sailing and you can take it to the nth degree like I have in this example, or you can do it at a lot lighter, quicker level because we don't often have so much time um, to do a full analysis. But as long as you're getting the information from the right place and you're thinking about what's coming in your mind. This is all back to the what's ahead of us. What do we what, what's going to happen? Um, you should be able to take something away from this. OK, so that, without further ado. So I've got I'm going to introduce the concept of brain casting. Um, this is unashamedly stolen from um, Hugh Stars and the RAA and their, folk, their Met guy. And I'm gonna then do a case study for yesterday showing you how I apply that brain casting technique. Okay. So what is brain casting? Brain casting is understanding the big picture of the weather on any given day in any location and building up your own forecast before you reach for the weather apps, okay? So you're not allowed to go onto windy, predict wind, magic seaweed, anything before you've given this a go, all right? And I tend to do this sort of over breakfast while I'm having a coffee. So over breakfast to do a brain cast, we need to. You need to know the general situation, what's going on with the weather systems at the moment by looking at a surface pressure chart, or you might know it as a synoptic chart and predict what we expect to happen for what we see. OK, so I'll go into a bit more detail with that in a minute. It's cheating a little bit because a surface pressure chart is effectively a forecast, but it's not detailed. It's not like one of the weather apps that's giving you the, 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 the wind speed and direction every hour. It's a lot sort of longer term. Big picture stuff, that's what we're talking about. Have a look out the window, take observations, what's going on with the sky at the moment? What are the clouds doing? 
what direction the cloud's moving and how fast. Have a look at one of the weather stations. We've got loads around here. Um, the Royal Limited Platforms, the one I always use because that's close to the area we, we sail in. Um, Hearst is okay as well. And if you're at another venue or you're studying up for another venue before you travel there, um, use a webcam. Um, it's quite often webcams on the sailing clubs or harbour offices or anything else. Um, we've got one on the yacht haven that's quite handy. That gives a picture of what's actually happening on the water. Check the braincast for what's happening now. Does it validate? So what you thought might be happening at eight in the morning from the braincast, does that look like what's really happening? Do they tie in? If they do, that's good news because whatever you're thinking about later is probably going to tie in as well. And then we go to the models, we go to the, the apps and we take a forecast from a range of the weather models that these apps offer and check back against the now cast, what we, what we just looked at does, you know, it's nine, it's eight o'clock in the morning. It says it's going to be now northeastly six knots from the forecast. Sorry, from, from what we're seeing on the, on the weather station, is that what we're seeing on the forecast? If it is, that's pretty good. Do all the forecasts agree? All the weather models agree on that? If they do, we've got a range of confidence if they all completely disagree, then we're in trouble. Anyway, moving on. Any questions on that bit? So far, nothing too tricky. Everything you can do over a cup of coffee, definitely. If you go into more detail, you probably takes the length of the time to eat a bowl of porridge, I find. Um, and then the, the most important piece is actually make notes of what we expect. Um, during the time that we're sailing and running up to that time. So as we go down to the club, what do we expect to see at nine in the morning? What do we expect to see? Maybe we're racing at 11, 11, 12, one o'clock. And the most important thing there is, do we expect any changes? So is there a front coming through? Does that mean a change in wind and a change in wind speed? How do we know when and if that's coming through? So we want to make notes that we're expecting something, okay? and what we think those signs might be. So if it's a front, is it a load of clouds coming through? You know, what is it? Then what we do, and this is probably the most important part of all of this, is go sailing. Keep one eye on the clouds for the signs of change that you expect, okay? Um, I'm not gonna go too much into the cloud stuff here now. I've got, I've got sort of cloud and thermal effects and everything else for another talk, I think. Um, but this is more about the sort of the process of putting this brain cast together that I want to focus on and how we use the um, surface pressure charts and apps. But the point is that when you do go, you're already prepared. You know you might be expecting a change, let's say mid-afternoon. It's very difficult when you're forecasting exactly when that change is coming through, but you should know what the telltale signs are going to be for the change. Okay. And finally, when you get ashore, Review what actually happened. Um, actually write it down. Um, go and have a look at the, the weather station again to see if that tallies into what you thought happened and how that tallies back to the weather forecast and score your accuracy. How well did you do on your forecast? And if you didn't do so well, what happened? Try and work it out. You know, was it just a bad forecast or was it a bad interpretation? Was there something funky went on, you know? Try and work out why, or you might need to do a bit more reading up on it. There's a few excellent books about which I can recommend later. Right, so that's the brain casting piece. So how do we read the general situation? This is the first part of our brain cast. We take the surface pressure forecasts, surface pressure charts, sorry, um, and the Met Office is brilliant for this, um, for where we live and for well, most of Europe, to be honest. And what you do is you take three charts. You take one at midnight just gone, 12 o'clock and midnight tonight. Okay, so you can, you're gonna have three. Before, near, soon and later, okay? What you're then doing is you're gonna have a look at the major systems that are on those charts, particularly starting at midnight last night. And you're going to track through by looking at the other two charts to see how fast and where they're moving 
OK, so that will give us a really clear picture of what is going on. Are we dominated by low pressure? Are we dominated by high? Is the high bouncing the low away? Is the low moving through quite quickly? All of these things will point to how the weather systems are operating and what we can expect. And already in our mind then, we've got a fairly big picture view of what sort of day we're going to expect ahead of us. So these systems, how do they affect where you're sailing? And on the chart, what do the ice bars indicate? This is probably the most important bit about the wind and are there any fronts expected? Okay, so probably the best thing to do with that is give you a quick example of a, a surface pressure chart and just talk through the, the features. Right, so this one was taken last May when I was studying this quite closely. I did, I did a whole study for about six weeks on sea breezes in the Western Solent. And um, this was just a day of, of interest to me. But I'm going to be quiet for a minute and I'm just going to ask you to have a look at this and think about where we live and talk me through what you think the dominant pressure system is and what sort of wind direction and speed we might expect from that. Any offers? High pressure dominant. High pressure dominant, yeah, that's the left here and up the top here, yeah, very good. Light, lightish winds. Why, why are they light? Our isobars are far apart. Yeah, so you've got three isobars here over a range of six, 700 miles, haven't you? That's only eight millibars drop over that period. So yeah, pretty light. What about direction? Where we live? It's circulating clockwise around the high pressure. Correct. So it's coming to us from the southeast. Yeah. Pretty much southeast, east, southeast. Yep. What you tend to do is uh, the three really good answers there. I think you bang on. What, as a really quick and dirty rule of thumb, what you do is put your, to get the wind direction, you just put them, like Malcolm says, it's clockwise around a high and anti clockwise around a low in the northern hemisphere. And what you do is you draw your arrows on at 15 degrees to the isobar from the high to the low side. Okay, so that's probably slightly nearer easterly here, okay. east, southeast, but that, it's an easterly airstream, which is the key. That's the, and as I say, this is quick and dirty. So it just gives us a feel. So from this, we're expecting a high pressure dominated day with light easterly breeze. Now, great so far. It's mildly, I mean, that, that, that's the takeaways from this. What is interesting on this particular day, <laughs> and I didn't really mean to get into this, it's just the one I chose, was, oh, that's just showing you the low going round here, the, going the other way around the low. Quite, you've, in summer, you, you very often get a low sitting over central Spain. It's got its own name. It's called the Spanish low. Um, and a low pressure is caused by heat coming off the land, rising upwards. So you can imagine the that whole peninsula is getting pretty, you know, in the sun just baking and rising up. So that, that's a really common feature to see a low, low mm. in the summer months over Spain. Mm. So here is um, courtesy of um, RPR weather file on the platform is the wind trace for that day. And just, just a quick note on that, you, on the wind traces, um, you quite often set these at local time and the charts come out at UTC. So that it's a bit like the tide sometimes, you go out an hour. So here on the screen here for one o'clock, which is equating to 12 here, you can see we've got an easterly. Yeah, okay, it's pretty good. But actually the wind's pretty strong, it's gusty. There's a bit going on here. And what's actually happening is it's a warm day, that big high pressure we we'll actually end up with a stonking southeasterly sea breeze, which is really unusual this far down the Western Solent. Very unusual. In fact, it's the strongest one I can remember. Um, we had a northeasterly gradient in the morning and it translated to that southeast in the afternoon. 
I won't go any further into that. It's just observational because I, I, I do want to. I've got a whole new other section on sea breezes at another time. Okay, so it's really reading that synoptic chart to get the general situation, which is of interest to us. Okay, so the reality is the, the forecast says east, and that's yep, yeah, that ties in. And then the wind builds in the afternoon and keeps veering round to the southeast for a, a funky old sea breeze. Right, moving on from that, then that's the general situation. Talk very quickly about the forecast apps. Um, they're much of a muchness in they're quite often taking the same weather models or the ones that are of importance. Um, the one on the left is predict wind and the one on the right is my favorite windy.com. Um, I used predict wind for easily 10 years because that was the superior one that was around. But my view is that that's been overtaken with the functionality of windy.com. Um, both available as websites and apps. I think they both work better as websites. I think you get more functionality and it's easier to read on a slightly bigger screen like your tablet or your, um, your laptop. The positives about Predict Wind are that they show, they're showing four models down the side here. Okay, you've got an Arome model, which is effectively France Meteo, um, which is the same people that do the BBC. PWG, which is Predict Wind's um, interpretation of the global GFS model. That looks like UK Met Office. So not sure why they've got two. And then, oh yeah, and Spire, I'm not sure what that is. But they have four models. And what I quite like from this is that you see the four models lined up against each other. And something I alluded to earlier is if the models correlate, then we've got a high degree of predictability or a high degree of um, confidence is the word in that this forecast is going to be good. If they diverge quite a bit, then not so much. So what they all agree on in this screen is definitely wind direction. They all like the fact that it's going to be that wind direction. What they don't agree on is what's the base wind strength. Okay. So I like this, as I say, because you can look at that and get a feel for it. Yeah. And then later in the afternoon, it sort of diverges a bit. This orange one isn't quite so sure, whereas these two tend to follow each other, the um, Arome and the GFS. The disadvantage I find of this is I don't get all the information on one page. I can't see the gust strength. And that's something I'm really interested in is the base wind speed to gust strength. Um, I sort of get the direction here, but it's yeah, it's, it, it, it's not quite as intuitive as maybe the windy model down here where I get the base wind, screen, wind speed here in color coded. And then I also get the gust speed as well and the wind direction with it. And also the air temperature and which is important as well later on in the year, the sunshine. Okay, so that's the apps. As I say, a lot of them are using the same models. Um, if you use one regularly, I'd have a look at what the models are and what the differences are between them. And over a period of time, you'll also learn which models to trust a bit more for where you live. So for where we live, um, ECMWF, which is the European one, and Arome, the French Met one, I find both of those really good for here. They quite often agree. Okay. So any questions on those apps? I'm sure everyone uses those all the time and, and sort of gets them. So, okay. So let's do a case study where we go through this principle of brain casting and you're gonna help me do this. So this was yesterday at midnight on the second. What is the dominant pressure system for the UK and where is it sitting? Right. Is high. Yeah, which one? What's the number next to it? So identify the high by the number. 103.6. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so that's how we do it. So everyone's talking the same language. Yeah. So it's high 103.6. What do we think about wind speed? So ice bar gaps. Sorry, say again. 
Very light. light. Very light. light. Yeah, okay. And what about direction? So clockwise around a high? Southeasterly. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, looks like it, doesn't it? Okay, so that on its own gives us something. But that was midnight. We're not sailing at midnight. We're sailing between 11 and 2 in this example, 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. So, oh, that's showing you there. You're showing your southeasterly on the arrow. I agree with you. Remember, the quick and dirty across the, across the isobar at 15 degrees from high to low. Okay, 12 o'clock. What do we think? What's happened? What things do we notice on there about pressure systems and isobars? The winds dropped a bit because um, the isobars are further above. Perfect. Yep. Yeah. And what about the two pressure systems either side? Low 1,020 and high 1,035. What's happened to low 1,020 compared to the first one? It's coming north. It's moving north, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. And the progression by midnight, this was midnight last night, 3rd of March. Yeah. What's happened there? Well, that low's carried on moving north. Yep. And um, what about, go on. Somebody else is about to pitch in with that. Claire, are you saying something because you mute? We were just saying the, about the numbers and presumably L1023 means that it's the pressure of the low pressure system is 1023. Yeah, which is actually quite high for a low, but yeah. High for a low. <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's relative. It's, it's, yeah. So what's happened there is you can see 1030, that high that was off Denmark has now moved out to be off sort of Shetland. Um, and we've got no isobars over the country. And that low from what was on north, um, northwest Spain has moved up north. And you can see there's a front coming through. So actually, this is what influenced today's weather. And in fact, the trough here actually overtook that and came through at midnight when I looked on today's chart. And that's you got a bit of rain overnight. And then this occluded front came across today, sort of lunchtime this afternoon. That's why we got a bit of drizzle on. <laughs> It hasn't been very nice all day, has it? It's just been a bit. Um, it's and the cold front catches up with the warm front. It is that that the, the so this low pressure system's gently moving up and over. I mean, it's it's not particularly strong. There's no breeze really associated with it, but it's definitely air mixing. And this sort of tepid, nasty, misty bleh, is is definitely what we're getting from that. So that gives us a nice clue on the general situation. So we expected southeast winds. This one's showing east. Well, what do we think this one's showing on this one? If I just track back one, if I take the thing there, it's kind of not dissimilar, is it? It's a sort of yeah. fairly similar direction. So, what's that? East, southeast, I guess. Yeah. Remember to tip your head because you've got to line yourself because <laughs> the chart's centered on the north, at, on the mid Atlantic. So, you've got to remember to tip your head north south. I always end up looking at it like that um, to line up. So you can get the degree on the compass. So yeah, okay. So the summary from that then was that the high 1036 shown in the first sequence dominates the UK weather, which we spotted. The low 1016 of Northwest Spain tracking slowly north up through Biscay with frontal activity ahead of it. We spotted that, good. What's your brain cast from this information? Well, we, we kind of did it, didn't we? We talked about the isobars at this time and and the wind direction so we're thinking mm, pretty pretty light in southeast. something that looks like east southeast yeah. possibly veering later to southeast but it's pretty it's a long way out okay so the next situation then is so bear in mind this was done at nine o'clock yesterday morning while i was having my coffee mm. The brain cast is the same as that. So dominated by high pressure, stable and steady conditions. Got a light northeasterly winds veering east and southeast later and weakening and no frontal activity expected. OK, so I'm going afloat now with that kind of or I'm, I'm heading into my forecast with that sort of information. 
and looking at my observations with that information. So my first job is to look at my observations and see if they tally with that. Am I going to see northeast wind on the platform? Yes. So how did we do? Do the observations match what we expect at 9 a.m.? So this is 9 a.m. yesterday morning. And you can see here the purple line at the bottom. So if I put the pointer on, it might be, oh, sorry, might be, I oh, can't get to it, never mind. The purple line here is showing nine o'clock northeasterly. The wind speed, the blue one's the average wind speed, that's showing us at about 11 knots. That's the picture at the Yacht Haven. And there's all that cloud we had yesterday morning. Um, it's hard to tell whether that's northeasterly or not from here because northeast for me would be coming a bit further around than that. It's hard to really say what's going on in the water. You can see some ripples coming over from there, but the platform, which is about, can you see it through the murk? It's about where my pointer is. Yeah. The, the wind instrument there is saying northeast to me. And in the Pennington Weather Bureau, which is where I'm sat right now, <laughs> um, that was definitely northeastly on my don't go meter. And again, a bit murky. Okay. So that's the observations we've taken. So we've correlated what we think is happening on the brain cast against what's happening now. Remember, that was an important step to validate. The next thing to do is going to have a look at a range of forecast models and see if they validate at nine o'clock. And then we can trust them going through the day. So from windy.com, I took these um, comparisons because you can do a nice compare on them. And the ones I'm interested in particularly are really ECM, WF, this one, and the Arom one. OK, so at nine o'clock, ECMWF says nine knots from the northeast. Well, that's pretty close. We had 11 from the northeast, didn't we? So not bad. And the Arome one, again, nine knots from the northeast, looking good. Out of interest, the other ones, Icon EU is showing 10. So that's pretty close. This one's underestimating, Meteo Blue. And the GFS model, yeah, that's pretty close as well, isn't it? They're all within a... A hair breadth. The GFS one is talking about sunny though, and it definitely wants sunny. Yeah. Um, so perhaps the Rome one from that was, was getting closer. So what I'm interested in is how much discrepancy is there. Um, it looks okay, we'd be fairly confident. One thing just to highlight on the models, and I'd urge you to go, as I say, research on the websites themselves what the models are doing, but they have this kilometer reading next to them. Has anyone got any idea what that means? Have you seen that before? Something to do with the range. Um, okay, the, the, the word I'm actually looking for is resolution. Um, and what it is, is the, if you imagine a grid put over the whole country as a chart, the grid is broken into certain kilometre squares. Yeah. So the Rome one is broken down into um, 1.3 kilometre squares. So at the edge of each one of those squares, 1.3 kilometers apart is where the forecast is taken. So where I place my dot on the chart, the next one point, the closest 1.3 kilometer corner on that square grid will be what I get. So the tighter the grid resolution, technically the more accurate the forecast or the more it'll take into account of land features and everything else that might be going on. So the GFS one, the global one, that's a 22 kilometer resolution. So that's great in the middle of the ocean. Not so good if you're around a really hilly mountainous features. It won't take into account of them. Um, the ECMWF is a bit better at nine kilometers. This one doesn't state what it is. And that one's at six kilometers. Okay, so that's what that is. Um, there's, again, some excellent reference material I can show you from Simon Rao, the British sailing team meteorologist, who explains this perfectly, why that resolution matters. Okay. Right, so here is our forecast, and we finally get down to the business of the forecast. And I'm going with the ECMWF model um, just because it has some extra features on it, which I quite like. It's got this thing called a meteogram, and it's got an airgram, which I think I showed you last week. And what I do is I plonk that spot in the chart. I oxymarsh here. I set that as a favourite. Um, it's right off the lake where we sail, where Bavistock is. The whole area is around there. It's where we do most of our sort of racing, cruising, training, whatever, in this patch of water. And 
we've got it down to now one hour resolution on the forecast. Okay. When we're doing the comparison, it'll only do it in three hour blocks, which makes it a bit harder, but we can, it's enough to, do they correlate or don't they correlate? I've then chosen this ECMWF one because my experience tells me that's that and the aroma are the better ones. And at nine o'clock here, it's saying nine. What's concerning is it's telling me it's gusting to 16, but we didn't see that on the, um, on the, on the platform wind indicator on the weather station. The reason, and the reason for that, I think, is because the air is a lot more stable. Um, we really are in a massive high pressure where there's, not, there's no real vertical mixing. Um, you're not pulling down high, high wind aloft and pulling it down to the ground like you might on a low pressure day. It's just not happening like that. So that nine knots, nine eleven, it was going a little bit more, wasn't it? On the if we go back to the this one, where is it here? Well, yeah, it's getting thirteen knots, but it's not a massive eleven to thirteen. Isn't a mass massive sort of um, increase gust speed? So that would be expected on a high pressure day. Not big, not big jumps. And then if we look at the area, the period we're looking to sail in, 11 till what, 11 till two, it's kind of seven knots. And you can see it's doing that thing we expected on the brain cast of northeast to easterly. And then later, uh, it doesn't show it on this one. It was the other one that went more southeasterly. This one's saying it isn't. Um, the Arome one did show southeasterly later. So here we're already starting to pick up now that this is tying in with what we think should happen and what we're expecting for later on. Now, the other thing to look at on this one, which is interesting, is clouds building here, just a bit later on. And that might be a little sign um, of that wind starting to change here. It looks like the wind might be changing, just veering with this clouds forming. So you might be looking out for that as an example of what to expect, okay? It's pretty crude, but it's a, you know, am I expecting that wind just to clock slightly right? Okay, so what do we do with all this information? Because at the moment, we're probably fairly overloaded. We need to distill this into something we can take on the water, either as just a few notes, or if we're being more serious about it, we write a check chart. Oh, sorry, that's, oh, sorry, this is the, I'll come back to that. We write a check chart, and this is what we would typically do for a venue that we're sailing at for the day. So what we do first is identify the sailing area. So you, you, probably recognize this as the Western Solent. Um, that's Bavistock there, and the river entrance is up here. So I'm only interested in this kind of blue area because that's where we're, we're kind of racing. What we do is we overlay the arrows for the wind direction that we're expecting across the course so we can visualize it a bit better. So we can see over time that that breeze is tracking round. We can also think what that means in terms of landfall. So as this breeze tracks around here, it might be just coming off the island slightly. I mean, if it was more southerly, we'd definitely be getting it off the island, but it helps us just start to visualize that a little bit. Um, the other thing I do is just drop in the actual forecast here to remind me, and then I write a couple of notes. So the bottom one is all about tide. So yesterday was a massive tide, and tide's another thing we're gonna come on to. It was a 4.7 meter range at Portsmouth. Notice I always use Portsmouth because that's how the tidal stream atlases are written. Um, Highwater Limington is almost irrelevant. Portsmouth is the main thing. Um, and that gives us a good clue of what a spring looks like. It's 125% over spring, so it's big. We've, we, and you'll all have seen, if you've been out walking this week, the tides are big. And those pictures coming from Milford Beach where the, the sandbar is exposed. So what we know is from a 1324 Highwater Portsmouth, about an hour and a quarter to an hour and a half before that, it will turn at Limington to ebb. So the tide will ebb this way. So we know in the middle of our racing or the middle of our cruising that at 12, we're going to expect the tide to start turning on the shore here. And then over the next sort of half hour or so, it'll turn across to eventually in the deeper water here. It's gone completely. This also tells us that because we're expecting light wind, tide will be hugely dominant. If we're only expecting sort of seven, eight knots of breeze and we've got a massive spring tide, tide is gonna be the key factor here, never mind any wind shifts. So what I do in the top left here is talk about the type of day. We think it's stable and steady. The, the stable in terms of um, vertical mixing, gusts, steady, 
in terms of oscillations, changes in breeze. Um, and we're saying there, look for high level cloud forming to indicate start of a change. Okay, so that is typically something we would take on the water with us and refer to, especially at a championship. But you can do this for fun anyway. And we as I say, we've been doing this all the way through lockdown because it, or through the first lockdown, because it was interesting. And because we were doing it ahead of our um, championship that's going to be in Penzance. So we've, we've done all this studying for Penzance and it's a lot harder down there because there isn't the same information available. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot more land around the venue as well in Mounts Bay, which makes it difficult. So we've had to think quite hard about that. And I've never been there. So I don't even know, you know, so I have to study quite hard from a, you know, but it shows it can be done and it'd be interesting to see how we go with that. So there's a summary to go flow. And just to round out, how did we do? What did it actually do yesterday? Well, we were pretty bang on with the wind direction. It came easterly near enough um, and it dropped. We expected the drop as well, didn't we? Those isobars were going a long way apart. Um, it came in a little bit more in the afternoon, just a little bit later on. And then by five o'clock when I was walking the dog, it had pretty much gone again. And I've got another picture. Um, I haven't got it here, but I've got another one from the webcam that we, from the wave barrier where it's showing, you know, like it did in the morning, fairly glassy, but with a bit of blue sky. So how did we do? I think we did pretty well on that one. That would be a fairly high scoring forecast and we'd be fairly confident with what we we're thinking. Now, in a high pressure system like that, where it's least slow moving, it's not, and especially without any thermal effects at this time of year, it's quite easy to score highly, I think. It's a bit cheaty. Where this might have been more interesting is if we'd had a really fast moving low pressure system, trying to predict when that was gonna come through, that would have been far more exciting for us and that would have been far more challenging. Um, but that, that's what I've got. How are we doing? Well, we didn't, we didn't run to midnight. <laughs> As I say, I could go for hours on this, but that, that is me. Have we got any questions on that approach? And just, if we, if we just take the simple piece that, you know, try and get to go back to basics on this, where it is all about Just know what the general situation is. Have a look out the window. Take some observations from the platform. And, you know, does it all tally? What does it look like? Then have a look at the forecast. And at least, as I say, at least you've got something in your mind why it's coming. Because just looking blindly at the forecast in the car park before you get out of the car on your weather app. Okay, you've got something that's better than nothing. But you haven't really got a feel for why. And it doesn't really reinforce it. If I do that, I just forget what the numbers said. It's just like, it just... It doesn't sink in. Whereas if I've gone through this process and written it down, it's nailed on. And actually what Dave and I find is we never look at our chart when we're out on the boat. We kind of remember because we've been through the process together. And what we did during lockdown is a great exercise. You might do this if you sell a double-handed boat or want to do this with your friends, is do this independently in the morning at eight, nine o'clock over breakfast. And then ring your pal up at five o'clock in the evening like we were doing and compare notes and how did you get on and why and what did you learn from it and also you might do you know if you're going want to go somewhere else in the summer let's say you're sailing at sulk and east lothian wherever it is you you're meant to be sailing this summer do one for there as well you know get one of you to do that and compare and then switch over the venues so i think before next week i'd like you all to have a go at one of these um <laughs> and just see how you get on with it you know if you don't get too far don't worry but it would be quite nifty just to pick a day that's exciting you know for getting some low pressure coming through brilliant that's the best thing to do and I'll, I'll try and pick that out as well and we can compare Tony Evans um, so, so you're the first person I've ever met that gets excited about a low pressure coming through so that's that's good um, it's wind Tony it's wind it's wind it's wind what's the, <laughs> out yeah, what's the <laughs> Okay, I might have missed it. How, how can you spot vertical mixing? Yeah, okay, that's really interesting. So it's probably a, a topic on its own, but, and there's a great video from Simon Rowell again on this, just about this. I mean, a lot of this I've just learned from talking to either Hugh or, or getting it from other videos and books. Um, 
let's find the vertical mixing one because I didn't really show you that. This is brilliant. So this is um, again on the windy.com site and this is called the airgram. And this is a uh, cross section at different times of the day of the air as you travel upwards. Okay, so if we take a one o'clock slice here, so I don't know why I can't, um, let me just try and get the pointer stuff up because that will be more useful. No, it won't come up for me, sorry. At one o'clock you get a vertical slice. So at ground level, you can see here, the easterly, we've got easterly breeze five knots. And as we go up, we've got very light winds all the way up, just they're all over the place. And even up in the sort of troposphere, we're still only 35, 25, 40 knots. So we're definitely not under any jet stream influence here. That is for sure. Um, and you're not going to, because it looks so light there, you're not going to get anything pulling down. Uh, the high pressure in itself would indicate low vertical mixing, but from this, you can definitely see it. Um, and I, I have another one here, which might blow your head off a bit, but I'd, I'd show you anyway, because it's again, it's available in the windy.com and it, it's something we've been working on and using just for learning more than anything. But this is called a sounding forecast. So what this is, is the same as you just looked at there at, at one o'clock, but it's a slice. Um, so it's got the same wind arrows down the side here. Okay. But what this also does is it measures, the red line measures the air temperature going up in altitude and the blue line measures the dew point. So we can learn quite a lot from this in terms of um, the fact that red line turns right means there's a temperature inversion quite low down and a temperature inversion you can imagine as being a cap on stopping any vertical mixing. So that's how, I, that's how I'm absolutely sure there'd be nothing. There was a great example of this um, on Friday afternoon where I went out to Sway to walk the dog and they were burning off the, um, the heathland, the, the moor, the, the gorse. And what you saw was a sloping line go up as the cloud went, as it went, it was obviously blowing a, a southwesterly, I think, coming up and then capping in not terribly high altitude. And then the smoke just traveling like that at quite a low altitude. And that showed to me there was definitely a temperature inversion there because the, the smoke just couldn't get any higher. It didn't have any more buoyancy. That air pocket that the smoke was in just didn't have any more buoyancy to rise further. So it was capped. So that again indicated there'd be low, low vertical mixing. So where this is really important is if it's low pressure, we know there's going to be quite a lot of vertical mixing from above. But where this gets really interesting is on sea breeze days. Is there going to be enough mix, mix, mix to help kick a sea breeze? Okay. I don't know how short an answer that was, or was that enough to help? Yeah, that's enough to help. Yeah, I just didn't, I missed. I thought I'd missed it, but no, that explains it. Yeah, I did. I'd skimmed over quite quickly on that. Just to... <laughs> any other questions? Was it useful? What the point? Yeah, I'm sorry. Very yeah. No, definitely. Did anybody learn anything? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's oh well. Huge. Oh. Achieved. <laughs> I say I've had that one up my jumper for ages. I've been dying to present it, but it's not the sort of thing you do on a Saturday afternoon because you just haven't got time. Maybe you just want to put the sails up and get out quite rightly. Um, what I've got as a follow up to this in terms of some, I've wrote, written a couple of articles on the back of this as well, which I've never put out there. So I'd quite like to try you out on those as well. Um, so what I'll do is probably put those up on the, uh, is everybody on the club Facebook site? Can you all get to that? Is there anybody that can't? No, I'm not on Facebook, Carl. Okay, don't worry. We'll um, we'll find a way to get it to you. I'll tell you what, the best thing to do is... You got a page on the website, Carl? Yeah, page on the website's good. Actually, that would work. Okay. So I'll tell you tomorrow. You need to be able to find it. Yeah, and what I'll do is I'll link... Um, this presentation and the two articles I've written. So the first article is exactly recapping all of this and how to do it. And then the second article is if you really want to get nerdy is how to um, <laughs> interpret these sounding forecasts. Mm -hmm. I wrote it really to reinforce what I'd learned. And one of the things we're being mentored on at the moment is when you've been taught something, 
teach it back to someone else because that's a great way of learning and cementing yourself. And I'd, that's one thing I was going to say to you all tonight, actually, was there's no reason that anyone on this call who isn't already couldn't be an assistant dinghy instructor, a dinghy instructor or a coach. It's a great way to, you know, I started learning when I became a coach and stopped learning. That's when it all began for me. I mean, Catherine, you're, this is something you're passionate about. You've coached at a really high level before. And yeah, I know you're, you're passionate about coaching. That's a good yeah. way to learn. It's, it's like all things, isn't it? You've got to be half a step ahead of the people you're talking to. <laughs> oh, is that teaching? <laughs> coaching slightly different. It's trying to bring the best out of everyone, isn't it? And ask the right questions. I'm not sure I did much asking there. There was a lot of telling. Okay, Gareth, anything to add to round out? No, I, th I think that that was fantastic. I, yeah, I was fascinated with that car. Really good. Oh, there we go. Let's, uh, okay, then. Um, so next week, um, what do we think, Gareth? Have we got any plans on next week? I can certainly carry on with weather if people are interested, weather and tides. Um, if you're going to do the technical. I'll do it a few requests. Could be a good Tide, tides would be really useful. Oh, yeah, be good. Tides, fantastic. Yeah, tides would be good. Tides and sea breeze. Trying to understand yes. sea breeze. Yeah, okay. cool. That's all right. They follow on really nicely. Yeah, okay. Because it all it all matters. Yeah, that's perfect. All right, I'm making it. I'll do that bit then. And Gareth, what do you reckon? Um, yeah, boat handling. We haven't done any of that yet, have we? Boat handling. Yeah. We can. Well, we, we did a little bit tonight, didn't we? we? Did an introduction there on the heel, what? how it was, didn't help you better away, but what about, about, what about a bit of um, slow boat control? Slow boat control, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. that works all as well. So that's we can apply that to coming off the slipway as well, can't we? And, and yeah. landing. Yeah, perfect. Those are all the list, weren't they? That would be fabulous. Are we sure we don't have any more questions or are we just totally blown mm -hmm. sideways and it's too late? <laughs> <laughs> no. No. It's, uh, it's really good. I really enjoy these, Carl and Gareth. Yeah, so they're fantastic. Really, uh, the lack of questions is, is not due to lack of interest. It's just uh, it's just really good to see this. I really enjoy it. I'm just worrying because we don't have a dog here, so there's none to eat my homework for next week. <laughs> Claire Slay, come on. <laughs> we can borrow a dog. Oh, can we borrow a dog? Apparently yeah, you can, we can borrow a dog. So you can borrow fine. mine. As long, as long, I think as long as it's covered in treats or cheese and it'll probably do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Michael eats it. Michael eats it. <laughs> hey, for your homework, you don't have to go into as much detail. If you just take, have a look at the, um, so in, in those articles I've put up, it'll have the links to everything as well and to some extra videos if you've got time to watch them. Um, on there's one on um, building a forecast for a venue, which I haven't spoken about because our venue is Limington. Um, and then there's one on vertical mixing. And then there's a brilliant one that this is all by the same guy, Simon Rowell. He did a brilliant one for the dinghy show last weekend where he took the forecast, much like I did at the beginning there, looked out the window with his cup of tea. And then they took one of the Olympic hopefuls on his foiling kite board onto, he lives in Falmouth, this guy. And they took him on the water and got him to zip around the harbour to look at all the different effects of the headlands and the channels. Yeah. And they took a couple of drones as well. They had one drone filming um, the clouds and the, the gusts underneath it and just concentrated on that all day and did a time lapse on that. And then the other drone just followed the, the kite surfer. Sorry, the, the um, I forgot what they call it. It's, it's windsurf with a foil, isn't it? It's full surf. And... Um, it was amazing, really interesting. So he put all his predictions in place, laid it out there, and then they did a load of GPS tracking as well to look at the, the kid's boat speed as he went round, board speed, boat speed, I don't know what you call it, to see how it happened when he went under a headland, what sort of mixing they were, you know, what gusts they were expecting, what effect the accelerations around the headlands they were effect, expecting. And it was brilliant because it just all mm. put into practice, kind of the next step of what we just did there, putting it into reality, so you're looking for a cloud and this cloud's coming, there must be a gust in front of it. Oh, here we go, there's a gust. <laughs> this headland's here, it must be doing something to the breeze. The breeze can't get over it, it's got to try and get around it, so it's accelerating. So all these things um, yep. put into practice with that video. And that, that I thought that was one of the best ones I'd ever watched. 
um, which inspired me to jump on this and try and do it. Mm. Very good. This one. Yeah, really good. Very good, guys. Thank you. It's all out there if we can be bothered to watch it. We can. <laughs> Yeah, we can. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank Cheers. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.